From Ezekiel 34. Therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, Behold, I, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep. Because you push with side and shoulder and thrust at all the weak with your horns, till you have scattered them abroad, I will rescue my flock. They will no longer be a prey. And I will judge between sheep and sheep. And I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David. And he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God. And my servant David shall be a prince among them. I am the Lord. I have spoken. I will make with them a covenant of peace and banish wild beasts from the land so that they may dwell securely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. And I will make them and the places all around my hill a blessing. And I will send down the showers in their season. They shall be showers of blessing. And the trees of the field shall yield their fruit and the earth shall yield its increase, and they shall be secure in their land. And they shall know that I am the Lord when I break the bars of their yoke and deliver them from the hand of those who enslaved them. They shall no more be a prey to the nations, nor shall the beasts of the land devour them. They shall dwell securely, and none shall make them afraid. Good morning. We're going to spend this morning studying two chapters in Ezekiel, chapter 33 and 34. We've skipped forward about 20 chapters from where we left off last week in Ezekiel chapter 11. And again, there's no way to cover all 48 chapters of Ezekiel in one month. But what we're trying to do is is go deep into four different sections that that really represent the main themes of Ezekiel and the main tone of Ezekiel so that you'll have a sense of the whole book. But I would strongly encourage you to read it yourself if you can. If you missed the last two weeks, Ezekiel, uh, along with many other Jews, has been dragged off into exile some 700 miles across the desert from their homeland. Their home was Israel along the Mediterranean Sea here. And they've been dragged across the desert to Babylon, which is current day Iraq, actually. And they don't know if they're ever going to see their home again. They've been dragged off because of their repeated unfaithfulness, their repeated idolatry, cheating on God with other fraudulent gods. But back in the city of Jerusalem, back in their homeland, the city still stands and the temple still stands. And there are still a number of Israel's leaders who are still living smugly in Jerusalem saying, hey, we didn't get dragged off. We, we must be fine. And so Ezekiel continues to warn them to turn from their ways. We skipped over a lot in the, in the 20 chapters between chapter 11 and, and, and these chapters here, some really hard to read passages, some, some horrifying passages, some bordering on obscene. God is hammering them with word pictures and bludgeoning them with metaphors and parables. Really this unrelenting drumbeat of doom, doom, doom. God, through the prophet, Ezekiel pleading with his people to repent. But words can only go so far because the people refuse to listen to Ezekiel's words. In chapter 24, several chapters back, Ezekiel's wife died and he is forbidden to mourn over the death of his own wife in order to be a mirror back to the people to reflect to them their own hardness of heart that they refuse to mourn even over their own destruction. You read through these chapters and and you want to look away. 
It's really awful, a lot of it. Ezekiel had the worst job ever. And now we come to chapter 33, and we're going to pause, slow down in chapters 33 and 34, because chapter 33 is an important pivot point, a turning point for the whole book. In chapter 33, news arrives. A refugee has escaped from Jerusalem and has come across the desert to Babylon and announces that the city of Jerusalem itself has finally fallen to the ground. The people kept rebelling against God. They kept rebelling against Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar had enough. He laid siege to the city of Jerusalem. He finally broke through its defenses. He went through the city, slaughtering left, right, and center. He tears the city to the ground, burns it, salts it, demolishes the temple. It's complete carnage. There's nothing left but a giant smoking crater. Everything that Ezekiel was trying desperately to prevent has finally happened. Everything that God did not want to do. Earlier in Ezekiel, in chapter 18, God had said, Repent and turn from all your transgressions. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord. So turn and live. Again, God repeats that same plea in this chapter, chapter 33, verse 11. Say to them, as I live, declares the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? But they refuse to listen. And so, in chapter 33, verse 21, we read this. In the twelfth year of our exile, in the tenth month, on the fifth day of the month, a fugitive from Jerusalem came to me and said, the city has been struck down. They really didn't think it could happen. Look at verses 24 and 25 from this chapter. Son of man, the inhabitants of these waste places in the land of Israel keep saying, Abraham was only one man, yet he got possession of the land. But we are many. The land is surely given to us to possess. Therefore, say to them, thus says the Lord God, you eat flesh with the blood and lift up your eyes to your idols and shed blood. Shall you then possess the land? Verses 30 through 33 are so spot on in their description of human nature. He says that the people talked together about Israel's warnings, his street theater, his they have endless discussions about it, endless curiosity. Verse 30 says, As for you, son of man, your people who talk together about you by the walls and at the doors of the houses, say to one another, each to his brother, Come and hear what the word is that comes from the Lord. And they come to you as a people come, and they sit before you as my people, and they hear what you say, but they will not do it. For with lustful talk in their mouths they act. Their heart is set on their gain. And behold, you are to them like one who sings lustful songs with a beautiful voice and plays well on an instrument. For they hear what you say, but they will not do it. When this comes, and come it will, then they will know that a prophet has been among them. Ezekiel did everything possible to get their attention. They came, they listened, they treated it as a curiosity, but they did nothing. God warns them in every possible way. He's been warning them for hundreds of years, actually, through the prophets, and yet they refuse. And so they are destroyed. Does that seem harsh? Do you wrestle with that? in your spirit, that the judgment of God, the justice of God. God's judgment is not something that we think about very often or like thinking about. The people of Ezekiel's day couldn't handle it. 
verse 17 of this chapter. It says, Yet your people say, The way of the Lord is not just, when it is their own way that is not just. When the righteous turns from his righteousness and does injustice, he shall die for it. And when the wicked turns from his wickedness and does what is just and right, he shall live by this. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not just. O house of Israel, I will judge each of you according to his ways. We struggle, you and I, to accept the justice and the judgment of God. A book much talked about this last year is Gentle and Lowly. It's a, it's a beautiful book. It's absolutely true. We struggle, this book says, to, to grasp how much God loves us, how deep and wide His mercy run. It's absolutely true. It is impossible to overemphasize how much God loves us because we can't even conceive how much He loves us. And it's true that, that God loves to show mercy. He's, he's quick to mercy and slow to anger. His default mode, if you, if you want to say it that way, is toward love and mercy. That's all true. <clears throat> and there's another work, another sermon written actually 280 years ago this month. It was written in July of 1741. It's also absolutely true. Jonathan Edwards wrote a sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. It was the most famous sermon in American history. Edwards was the most brilliant theologian that America ever produced. He was a graduate of Yale, eventually became the president of Princeton, the Ivy League school. I was talking this last week with Kelly McCarg, who teaches English at Central City, and I'm a former English major, so myself, myself. So we English majors like to talk shop sometimes. And, and we were talking about the fact that she's teaching a unit this fall to her freshman English class on American literature. And she was wanting to take a look at Jonathan Edwards and the Puritans because they played a really key role in early American literature. The Puritans invented compulsory public education. They valued Scripture so much that they wanted everyone to be able to read the Bible for themselves, from the senator's son all the way to the common plowboy. And Kelly was thinking about introducing her students to this particular sermon of Jonathan Edwards, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And my, my initial reaction was, I don't know if that's the best one to introduce them to, because, well, Edwards, who was a New England Puritan, he preached that sermon at the height of the Great Awakening, which was a, a great revival that swept through the colonies, American colonies in the 1740s. And it's really ironic that Edwards is best remembered for that particular sermon, because when he was alive, Edwards was known primarily for his teaching on the love of God, the mercy of God, the beauty of God. But Edwards also loved the holiness of God. And after Jonathan Edwards died and the Puritans began to fall out of favor in New England, they were replaced in popularity by another religious group called the Unitarians, who did not believe in God's judgment, did not like at all Edwards or the Puritans. And the Unitarians wanted to make Edwards look as bad as possible. And so they fished around for the most scorching, least politically correct sermon that they could find, and they came up with Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God by Edwards. And they took that sermon and they put it into the canon of every American literature book that every high school student would read. It went into every college American lit book. This is my college American lit book. It's, it's in here. Um, and the reason they put it in there was, was intentionally to make Edwards look bad. 
they wanted to make him look as wild-eyed and rabid as possible. And yet, that sermon, Sinners in the, angry, in the Hands of an Angry God, for all of its scorching heat, is also true. It's just as true as gentle and lowly. For us, it is nearly impossible for us to get our minds around, our finite minds, around the unfathomable depth of God's love and the blazing heat of His holiness. We struggle to hold both of those things in our minds at the same time. G.K. Chesterton put it this way. He says, we take, we human beings, we can take a, a vibrant red color and a brilliant white color, and, and we turn them into a mushy pink. But God is not like us. God can take vibrant red and brilliant white and hold them together and not dilute either one of them, either the love of God or the holiness of God. And yet, the Bible tells us that God's, God's love and His, His holiness are directly connected to his anger. His anger directly flows from his love. How in the world does that work? How can that be? I am a father. I have four kids. I I love them desperately. If anyone threatens any of my four children, my righteous anger immediately rises against that person. If an evil person threatens to do them harm, uh, what, if, what if I was apathetic in the face of the harm of my children? What, what would you think of me as a father? When we lived in Asia, we lived in a small town that had a major crime problem. Sandy got held up at knife point four times in about a two-month span, and Always when Anna was with her, Anna was seven or eight at the time, and always when I was not with her. But one day, I was walking to the school uh, with Anna by my side, and I ha- actually had a 40-pound gunny sack of oranges over my left shoulder, and Anna was over here at my right side, just kind of chattering away as she would do. And we were walking along. It was about a seven-minute walk to the school from our house. And I, I suddenly sensed something at my left side, and I looked down, and some dude was wrist deep in my left pocket, fishing for my wallet. And so I, I kind of spun around and, and nailed him, and he, he went down, and he popped up with a switchblade in his hand, and a, literally about three feet apart stood doing this. At me. And within a few moments, a couple of his buddies came out, from around the corner behind another building next to us. And Anna's still here at my right side. And I was describing this scene later that evening to Sandy back at home. And she said, that was really stupid. (laughs) You you know those guys work in packs. They they always work in groups of three or four. You, You can't take three or four of those guys at once. And I said, thing you don't understand. Our daughter was with me. Those guys, all they care about is money. I had rage on my side. I don't care how many of them there were. They don't have righteous, holy rage on their side. Um, You know, in that moment, my anger was a direct product of my love for my daughter. If we had a local sheriff or a local judge who didn't really care about crime, who just brushed off uh, evil in the community, what would we think of them as as a local sheriff? How much more a father who was unconcerned by someone molesting his child? How much more a God who didn't give a fig for the human wreckage caused by sin. God's wrath is a direct product of God's love. In his book on the Trinity, it's a wonderful little book, Michael Reeves 
He says that God, in eternity past, existing in the, in the perfect joy and unity and oneness and love of the Trinity, God didn't experience anger in eternity past. And in eternity future, God will also not experience anger. He's, he's going to be fully engaged in, in the love of us and the Trinity. God's anger, you could say, is not native to him. His love and his joy and his holiness are native to him. However, for God to be apathetic towards sin would not be love. How could it be? Because sin destroys the people that God loves. God's unfathomable love for people leads to a white-hot righteous anger when the people that he loves and the world that he loves is ravaged by sin. There is something inside of each of us, something good, I think, that resonates with a, a good Clint Eastwood flick where he just goes nuclear on the bad guys, right? Some, something, some of that righteous sense of justice rises up in all of us. There's a scene in another movie, a Liam Neeson movie called Taken, I don't know if you've seen it, where an international group of terrorists kidnaps his daughter and he manages to speak with one of them on the phone. And I will not try to duplicate Liam Neeson's wonderful Irish accent. But this is what he says to the, to the bad guys, to the terrorists. He says, I don't know who you are. I don't know what you want. If you're looking for ransom, I can tell you I don't have money. But what I do have are a very particular set of skills Skills I have acquired over a very long career. Skills that make me a nightmare for people like you. If you let my daughter go now, that will be the end of it. I will not look for you. I will not pursue you. But if you don't, I will look for you. I will find you. And I will kill you. Sometimes we think, the Old Testament God, that was God in his, his adolescent hormonal stage. He was angry all the time. Now in the New Testament, he, he's mellowed out. The, the New, New Testament God is, is much nicer. He, he's more chill. No, the Old Testament, including the book of Ezekiel, is full of beautiful passages of God's love and mercy and compassion. And in the New Testament, no one speaks more about the justice and judgment of God than does Jesus himself. God hates sin because sin destroys the people that God loves. As we said, chapter 33 of Ezekiel marks a huge turning point, a pivot point. Up until now, Ezekiel's main task has been to disturb the comfortable, the complacent. But now, the unthinkable has happened. Jerusalem lies in ruins. The temple is a pile of rubble. From here on out, God's main task through Ezekiel is going to be to comfort the disturbed. Chapter 34 of Ezekiel is a lengthy word picture on shepherds and sheep, bad shepherds and scattered sheep. Chapter 34, verse 1 says this, The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, Thus says the Lord God, Ah, shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding yourselves, should not shepherds feed the sheep? The Bible was written in an agricultural context, full of agricultural metaphors and images. Among the most common are those of 
shepherds and sheep. Israel had a rich heritage of sheep herding. The the father of the 12 tribes, Jacob, his primary livelihood was as a shepherd. A number of Israel's most famous leaders had been shepherds. Moses, you think about that, he, he went and lived in the Sinai wilderness for 40 years and herded sheep as preparation for leading the people out of Israel and and through the wilderness. Israel's greatest king, King David, where did God find him? He found him as a young man in the highlands of Israel, herding sheep on a hillside. Chapter 34, God uses the metaphor of shepherds to call out Israel's leaders. It's political leaders, it's religious leaders. What is the charge against these leaders? Verse 3, you eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. So these leaders fatten themselves, they enrich themselves at the expense of their sheep. Verse 4, The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them. These leaders have used their position not to care for the sheep, but used it for their own personal gain. They have failed to care for the weak, the sick, the injured. They've not gone looking for the lost. And they themselves have ruled with force and harshness. And the result, it says in verse 5 and 6, So they were scattered because there was no shepherd, and they became food for all the wild beasts. My sheep were scattered. They wandered over all the mountains and on every high hill. My sheep were scattered over all the face of the earth with none to search or seek for them. Lack of leadership, poor leadership, leads to confusion, scattering. The sheep become prey for predators. Unfortunately, you don't have to look around very hard to find examples past and present, of leaders who have failed their people. Not only failed to lead them, but used and abused their own people. Verses 7 through 10 say this, Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, declares the Lord God, surely because my sheep have become a prey, And my sheep have become food for all the wild beasts, since there was no shepherd. And because my shepherds have not searched for my sheep, but the shepherds have fed themselves and have not fed my sheep. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against the shepherds and I will require my sheep at their hand and put a stop to their feeding the sheep. God opposes bad leaders. I have to tell you, as a pastor, this passage is really hard to read. It's sobering. The English word for pastor actually comes through the French from an old Latin word that literally meant shepherd. It's the same root word for pasture. You might think, that shepherding was a uh, a soft, fluffy profession. Not so. Raising sheep in the harsh climate of the Middle East was not for the faint of heart. Shepherds had to be tough. Their sheep didn't live on a dry lot or or in a feedlot. It was free-range grazing in rough wilderness terrain. More like Cowboys of the Old West than something from a Gazi Thomas Kincaid painting or something. 
In fact, the wealthier classes looked down on shepherds. Shepherds' skin was usually dark and wrinkled from the sun. Their, their faces had lines on them. They were wiry and lean and dirt under their fingernails. They worked in harsh terrain with a harsh climate. It required attention and skill and intelligence and grit. Predators were real and abundant in the Judean wilderness. Wolves, bears, thieves was a dangerous calling. And at this point in Israel's history, its shepherd leaders had failed and God has had enough of them. Verse 10, No longer shall the shepherds feed themselves. I will rescue my sheep from their mouths, that they may not be food for them. God will take it upon himself to rescue his own sheep. Verses 11 through 12. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, I myself, will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep, and I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. In verse 13, God continues this promise to rescue his own. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them into their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the ravines, and in all the inhabited places of the country. He continues, verses 14 through 16. I will feed them with good pasture, and on the mountain heights of Israel shall shall be their grazing land. There they shall lie down in good grazing land, and on rich pasture they shall feed on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. And I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak, and the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them in justice. God continues with these beautiful promises in verse 22. I will rescue my flock, and they shall no longer be a prey, and I will judge between sheep and sheep. Does God do this? Does God keep this particular promise? The nation of Israel did come back after 70 years of exile in Babylon. They came back to their homeland. But there was still so much wrong, as Haggai told us. There was still no peace. They were still under constant threat from their warring neighbors. Verse 23, God continues, And I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God. And my servant David shall be prince among them. I am the Lord. I have spoken. What what is going on here? How in the world is God going to make David their shepherd? David died nearly 400 years prior to this passage. And David didn't exactly end his career on a high note. Things went south for David when he, as the Bible said, took Bathsheba for himself and murdered her husband. In that moment, David looked a lot more like the bad shepherds that Jesus is describing than the good shepherd. In fact, what what is the parable that the prophet Nathan used to confront David? It's a parable of a rich man who steals the lamb of a poor man How is David going to be their future shepherd, their perfect shepherd? Did God do this? 
Did God keep this promise to come himself and shepherd his people? Is there a place in Scripture where we can turn to to see this promise fulfilled? Actually, there is. If you flip forward in your Bibles to the New Testament, to the Gospel of John, John chapter 10. And John 10 is also an extended word picture of shepherding. In John 10, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. Jesus claims this mantle for himself. He steps into this role himself. When God says that that God, God himself, will come and shepherd his sheep, Jesus says, I am that good shepherd. I am the one. It's an astonishing claim. But there's no question Jesus was deliberately placing himself squarely into Ezekiel 34. John 10 opens just as Ezekiel 34 opened with threats to the sheep. John says in chapter 10, verse 1, Jesus actually says these words, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. Sheep farming in in Bible times was tough. At night, the flock slept in a rough pen out under the stars. Sheep are remarkably defenseless creatures. They're sort of an argument against Darwin's survival of the fittest. I'm not sure how they've lasted this long as a species. Not only are they physically defenseless, they're also remarkably stupid. They don't even make much noise when when they get killed. We have a little video here that kind of gives you an idea of uh, of sheep. I don't know if you've seen this. (laughs) That, That little clip is sort of the entire history of Israel and the Old Testament, right? Uh, Sometimes it seems like sheep wake up in the morning and they huddle up and they say, which one of us is going to die today? And what creative new way are we going to think up to do it? Literally this week, I think it was Monday or Tuesday, I I went out into my pasture and I found a, a ewe who was stuck in a tree. She she'd been trying to climb up to to reach as high as she could to to eat some leaves off a tree, and she'd gotten, managed somehow to get both of her front hooves wedged in the fork of a tree, and she was was stuck as high as you could imagine that she would get, and she would have died up there if I'd not been able to extract her. Sheep seem to like to die, and there are many predators who are happy to help them. In John chapter 10, verses 3 through 4, Jesus says this, The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Some Middle Eastern shepherds will put their flocks, that they will pool different flocks belonging to different shepherds in the same large enclosure at night. And you would think, well, the next morning, how in the world do they sort out their sheep from the other shepherd's sheep? And the way they do it is each shepherd calls in his own unique voice and his sheep will gather around him because they know his particular voice. Verses 7 through 9. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out 
and find pasture. Middle Eastern shepherds would would actually sleep in the narrow entrance to the sheepfold, the pen, and any predator would literally have to go through him or go over him to get to the sheep. A wolf or a bear would happily tear a sheep in pieces. By contrast, the shepherd knows his sheep. He, He has an affection for his sheep. He cares for them. He looks to their needs before his own. But the shepherds that Ezekiel condemns, they put their own needs first. That's not Jesus. Jesus says in John 10, verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Sometimes we we see these paintings that imagine Jesus with a, a fluffy lamb over his shoulder And it looks like he just came from the hairdresser (laughs) or an appointment with a makeup artist. And his clothes are pressed and spotless. That is not a very realistic picture of a shepherd. Jesus was both tender and tough. Jesus says, verses 12 through 13, He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. In Bible times, a sheep-owning family, if they were a larger, more well-to-do family, they might hire an under-shepherd, a watchman, a hireling to guard the gate. The hireling does not own the sheep. He's just there for the paycheck. So when the going gets rough and the wolf is growling out there in the shadows, he may cut and run because he's more concerned for his own skin than for that of the sheep. But Jesus says he would even give up his own life for his sheep. I don't even know any sheep owners who would give up their life for their sheep. John 10, verse 14 continues, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. We can know our shepherd. He knows us, and that Knowing is grounded in an in a even deeper knowing. The way that the Son knows the Father. And the Father knows the Son intimately. Verse 16, Jesus echoes Ezekiel's promise. The promise to gather his people, his, his sheep, his, his sheeple, from, from the nations. Verse 16, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold, I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. Jesus doesn't just fulfill God's promise in Ezekiel to bring out his people from other nations. He he actually expands this promise. Jesus says, I'm not just rescuing Jewish people out of the pagan nations around them. I am calling pagan nations, pagan people, foreigners to myself to be a part of my flock. Gentiles, us. In Jesus, Jew and Gentile, rich and poor, slave and free, male and female, they are all gathered into one flock with one shepherd, one people of God. Verses 17 to 18, Jesus says, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. 
This charge I have received from my Father. Jesus is the opposite of the evil, self-serving shepherds. Leaders who take and do not give. Jesus laid down his life to make you his own. His death was not accidental. He willingly gave up his life for us. And by his death and his resurrection, Jesus makes possible the fulfillment of all of God's Old Testament promises. Jesus is the fulfillment of God's Old Testament promises. Jesus says that if you are his sheep, if you belong to him, then you will know his voice and you will follow him and he will lead you, lead you with love and mercy and compassion and kindness. He will lead you through the valley of the shadow. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, that you did not leave us to ourselves, that you set your own Son to be our shepherd and to care for us. We, we recognize we did not deserve it when we had strayed, gone our own way, that you came and pursued us. And I pray that you would help us to respond to your, your grace and your mercy and to, to listen to you, to your voice, to follow you, shape us into a people that, that are your own. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen.